Good morning and welcome to Compass Christian Church's online worship service. Here it is, we're only 10 days into the new year and already good things are happening. The Cleveland Browns made the playoffs. Won't you join me in our opening song? Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing standing I'm standing on the promises of God standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God I shall prevail standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing standing I'm standing on the promises of God standing on the promises I cannot fall listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God. We're grateful you're joining us today and are holding you in prayers. Please go online to compassc.org. Forward your prayer request and our church will pray for you. Consider joining the ways we're extending care into our community or supporting with an online gift or helping hand fund for those that need a hand up. We're grateful for your interest and especially for your presence and prayers, I invite you to join me in prayer. Let us pray. God of boundless compassion, we come before you today thankful for the gift of this new year. Give us eyes to see the new thing you are doing among us in 2021. Give us ears to hear the new words of life that you have yet to speak. Give us hearts to love those that others fear, despise, or neglect. Give us minds to seek your truth that we might be free indeed. Give us hands to receive your gifts and share those gifts with others. Give us tongues to speak your praise and share your grace. Give us feet to walk in the path you've laid for us this year following wherever you lead. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 29. Listen for God's word. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood 
that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. Here ends our reading. May God bless our hearing, understanding, and living of these words. It was a calm Sunday afternoon in the tri-state area on July 27, 1980. Then, in Sharpsburg, Kentucky, something strange started happening at 2.50 p.m. Buildings shook, chimneys fell, and even the ground opened seven and a half miles away. An earthquake of magnitude 5.2 on the Richter scale struck. Although Sharpsburg is 45 miles southeast of Cincinnati, nonetheless, it caused moderate damage here. Windows were broken in Reading. Phone service was knocked out and chimneys downed throughout the area. Cincinnati's City Hall sustained minor damage when a stone fell from the roof, damaging the entrance steps. It was the strongest quake recorded in Kentucky and was widely felt throughout the eastern United States. Those who've experienced an earthquake understand something that others do not. Terra firma isn't so firm. After a quake, we know something in the marrow of our bones. The ground beneath us isn't solid after all. 2020 surely had more than its share of shocks as the foundations of our democracy, the pillars of our health care system, and the bedrock of our economy were shaken to the core. That shaking cracked the facade of America's house, exposing structural inequities and systemic racism for all the world to see. In 2021, those aftershocks continue liquefying institutions we once thought were rock solid. What's our first reaction when the earth begins to shift and the supports we've built our life on begin to sway and crack? What do we do when we lose our job, when a spouse or child suddenly dies, when we're facing eviction the nest is suddenly empty, or illness or injury incapacitates us. What do we do when we're isolated and despairing? What remains solid in our life when all the familiar landmarks are shaken away? Our passage from Hebrews has some answers. Perhaps we resonate, resonate with words from Hebrews 12, 26 to 27, where God says, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven, to remove what is shaken, created things, so what cannot be shaken may remain. God, whose voice shook the earth on Mount Sinai, will speak once again at the end of time, and shake the heavens. All that is not anchored to the solid rock of salvation, the cornerstone of Christ, will be shaken away. Our reading begins with Moses appropriately trembling before the presence of the Lord on Mount Sinai. The reading then moves to another location, to Mount Zion, 
and the heavenly Jerusalem, where we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Moving between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion involves crossing borders from this world to the next, a journey all of us are on, even in this life. When we cross the border into another country, a border patrol officer asks us some pointed questions. And when we're asked by the border agent, we want to have the right answers. There are five key questions that we need to know the answers to when we're asked. In the Bible, we'll discover some unshakable answers to life's five big questions as we travel from one country to the next. Knowing the answers to these questions is the difference between building a life on shifting sands or solid rock. Let's take a look. The first key question is, who are you? We could define ourselves relationally. In part, we are brothers or sisters, husbands or wives, fathers or mothers, sons or daughters. But that identity is not all we are, because life quakes come and loved ones leave. Or we could define ourselves vocationally. In part, we are what we do. We are doctors or business managers or auto mechanics or teachers or computer programmers or engineers or police officers. But that identity is not all we are because life quakes come and vocations change and retirement happens. Our identity is further fractured if we attempt to define ourselves otherwise. We identify as either conservative or liberal, Democrat or Republican, optimist or pessimist, Leo or Capricorn, Protestant or Catholic. All those facets of our identity can be shaken away. And what are we left with? There is one unquakeable truth about us that can never be disturbed. Who are you? You are a child of God. Who am I? I am a child of God. This is our most fundamental identity, sons and daughters of God. During the struggle for civil rights, Black churches were a bulwark against a racist society that told them they were nobody. In the black church, they were reminded of their true identity, that of being children of God. Outside the church, others said they were nobody. But inside the church, they knew they were somebody, children of God. Because of that unquakeable truth, they made inroads against systemic racism, leading to greater equality. The first question is, who are you? And the answer is, a child of God. The second key question is, where do you come from? Americans are, mo are the most mobile people in the world whether in search of new jobs, new scenery, new chances, or a whole new life, we move from place to place without ever putting down roots. We're like tumbleweeds in the wind, rolling from one place to the next at the mercy of whatever weather we find ourselves in. Because we are so mobile, when asked, where do you come from? We often reply with whatever region we identify with most, from the East Coast, or from the South, or Midwest, born and bred. We're apt to answer regionally, and we believe we've named something about ourselves and given others insights into our identity. 
But that identity is not all we are, because life quakes come and people move. Another way to respond to the question is to give the genealogical answer. Asking where you come from often leads to answers about our ancestors. Genealogical research is a hobby for many and a business for others. As rootless Americans, we're ones like, who like Alex Haley, are searching for our roots, where we come from, for our people. But that identity is not all we are, because life quakes come and family trees can splinter. Perhaps this is part of the reason it has become so important for all of us to claim ourselves as hyphenated Americans these days. Ironically, since most of our moving about occurs within the continent of the United States, we are quite likely to identify where we come from as the one place we've probably never been. Asian Americans, African Americans, Irish Americans, Latinx Americans. As Christians, we can claim a rich lineage of relations who will never disown us. Our genealogy comes from the history of Genesis through the visions of the New Jerusalem. Our people are the people of God. Our spiritual ancestors are the patriarchs and matriarchs, the kings and queens, the spies and prostitutes, the tax collectors, fishermen and prophets. It's a heritage that is vast and unshakable. To the question, where do you come from, we reply, from the long lineage of the people of God. The third key question is, where are you going? All of us like to feel as if we're going somewhere, preferably up the ladder. The drive to be a success in our chosen field is a powerful stimulus for lots of people. Unfortunately, the drive for success comes at a high price for many. Stress-related heart attacks, crumbling families, and ethical violations. Parents across the generations worry that their children won't have as much of a chance to do better than them. Being upwardly mobile is part of our identity, but economic quakes come that wipe out pensions, life savings, and health insurance. Another way to answer this question is through class status. Members of the middle class are finding it increasingly difficult to keep up with the Joneses as jobs are downsized, moved to other countries, or simply disappear with the pandemic. Members of the lower class have dreams of upward mobility, but face increasing numbers of doors being slammed in their faces. Gauging where we're going by how we're doing economically may end up giving us a life map that looks like a roller coaster track at Kings Island, one that could derail before it's over. However, there's a different destination for, of, for those whose faith is centered in Mount Zion, or the city of the living God, or the heavenly Jerusalem. All these celestial addresses are attempts to describe the goal and glory of basking in the rock-solid presence of God. A life of faith is lived knowing that there is no road we may travel, no matter how twisty or bumpy it may seem, that cannot, with Christ, lead us into the divine presence. To the question, where are you going? We can answer, we're going to Mount Zion. The fourth key question is, what is your purpose? This question stares accusingly at us, at many people throughout their lives. Rick Warren of Saddleback Church has sold millions of copies of his two books, The Purpose Driven Church and The Purpose Driven Life. 
Churches and people are looking for purpose. People shuffle from one job to another, one church to another, from one fad to the next. They don't know whether to become vegetarians or young Republicans, save the rainforest, or start their own business. Like Hamlet, they're unsure of what to do, if anything. Their life is one long soliloquy, to be or not to be. Unsure of their directions or convictions, they sink into apathy and end up doing nothing. In middle age, they're still wondering what they'll be when they grow up. Others have just the opposite anxiety. These are the people who join every committee ever formed and volunteer to be the chairperson. They're always busy as a bee. They cram their lives with activities from sunup to way past sundown. But when things begin to shake, they too may find there is little purpose to all their busyness. Instead of serving the rules of any particular organization, the Christian life is dedicated toward a bedrock purpose whose pervasive nature enables it to be infused into every facet of our existence. Our purpose is to love and serve the Lord and to love our neighbor as ourselves. To the question, what is your purpose? We can answer, love God and neighbor. The fifth key question is, how long will you be? Few realities of life bring on the shakes more swiftly than the fact of human mortality. Truth be told, it's the fear of death that makes skating over those sliding tectonic plates such a frantic, frazzled dance. How long do we have? Is the question we long to ask, yet fear to know the answer. As the Psalms say, Lord, let me know my end, the measure of my days, that I may gain wisdom of heart. If we knew the length of days we had, it would surely impact positively how we spent those days. We'd be reminded of the preciousness and giftedness of life and have a wise heart. Since we do not know the measure of our days, however, it's incumbent upon us to treat those around us as if we only had 24 hours of life left. Imagine how different our life and world would be if we made our peace with others on a daily basis, reconciled our differences with loved ones before sundown each day, and gave of ourselves to the utmost for others. We want to know, how long will I be? And we get different answers depending upon whom we ask. Life insurance salespersons will look at their charts, calculating our estimated length of life based on our parents' and grandparents' health and our lifestyle. In the end, however, it's just an average. At the end of our earthly lives, when we ask for ourselves or on behalf of loved ones, Doctor, how much time do I, does he or she have? The best they can give is an educated guess. Life insurance salespersons and doctors can guess, but God knows. Our great key to peace is that Christ has given us the answer. Through his death and resurrection, Christ is able to offer us eternal life. As Hebrews 2.15 says, Jesus came to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. To the question, how long will we be, 
we can answer, we will be forever. When the quakes of life come, as they surely do, we can be prepared with unshakable answers. As we cross from one country to the next, we'll meet all kinds of border agents. And we'll be tempted to forget who we really are, but then remember, we are children of God. We'll question where we're really from, but we'll call we're from the lineage of God's people. We'll wonder where we're going, but know we're on the way to Mount Zion. We'll question our purpose, but recollect we're to love God and neighbors. In times of loss, we'll wonder how long we'll truly be, but remember that we've been freed from death through Christ's resurrection and will be with him and others forever. Thanks be to God for Jesus, the answer for every question, the one that holds us in the shaking of our lives and transforms us to be like him. Amen. We come now to our time of communion, a time when we accept Christ's invitation to gather around his table. Won't you join me in singing our hymn of invitation? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath has covenant, and his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. It is here that the solid rock of God's grace stands, where the promises of our Savior are received and shared each week. As we come to this table, we remember that when Jesus was gathered with his friends, he took bread. And when he'd given thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. Again, he gave God thanks and praise. And he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all, so that sin may be forgiven. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again in glory. I invite you to join with me in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Knowing our identity, origin, destination, purpose, and duration, let us go into a trembling world grounded in God's unshakable love revealed to us through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.